Some hope in chariots, some hope in wealth. My hope is Jesus and nothing else. Oh, such love, such love and grace leads me to see my Savior's face. Some hope in armies and the strength of man. My hope is Jesus who calls me friend. He bears me up if I should fall. My everything, my all in all. What love is this that knows no faithfulness what help will he not give the son of God through whom I live some hope in fortune some hope in fame my hope is Jesus, salvation's name. For there he hung and bore my sin, that I might live and bear his name. What love is this, the Savior's blood? Sacrifice to save my soul. What love is this that knows no pride or selfishness? Poured out upon my need, love's work is done and I am free
Thanks, Mclisi. Good evening, and welcome to our second night of Holy Week. Thanks, Pip, I heard you. As we continue our journey with Jesus towards Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday, we have the joy of hearing God's revelation tonight from Reverend Melanie Cook. Um, for those of us who don't know her, she uh, will make herself known shortly. But uh, I think you're well known here, Mel. It's well good to have you, and uh, we welcome you and, and Gordon. If you missed last night's reflection from Rob, <clears throat> Jesus can and will disrupt our lives to bring about change and move us out of complacency, turning the tables of my life over, but he doesn't stop there. And so we come with anticipation for what God will bring tonight through Mel. Our call to worship comes from 1 Peter 2, verses 4 to 10. And, and like um, <clears throat> the call to worship last night was slightly different, so I think tonight's is too. So we'll see where God is leading us. <laughs> Welcome to the living stone the source of life. The workman took one look and threw it out. God set it in the place of honor. Present yourselves as building stones for the construction of a sanctuary vibrant with life, in which you will serve as holy priests, offering Christ-approved lives up to God. The scriptures provide precedence. Look, I am setting a stone in Zion, a cornerstone in the place of honor. Whoever trusts in this stone as a foundation will never have cause to regret it. To you who trust him, he's a stone to be proud of. But for those who refuse to trust him, the stone the workman threw out is now the chief foundation stone. For the untrusting, it's a stone to trip over a boulder blocking the way. They trip and fall because they refuse to obey, just as predicted. But you, you are the ones chosen by God, chosen for the high calling of priestly work, chosen to be a holy people, God's instruments to do His work and speak for Him, to tell others of the night and day difference he made for you, from nothing to something, from rejected to accepted. And so come, let us stand and worship and sing, Jesus Christ, my living hope.
Let us pray. Fathers, we reflect upon Jesus' journey. We understand and we give praise and thanks for these words that Jesus Christ is my living hope. Our hearts are filled with praise for all that you have done. We are in wonder and awe. that words sometimes cannot capture or explain. And so we, we bring more worship, Lord, to you as we continue singing, Jesus, may you be the reason that we live.
Jesus, be the center, be my source, be my light, Jesus, be, be the fire. be seated. We're going to continue our time as we continue in prayer. Let us pray. Father, as we've been singing those words, for you to be the center, the source of so many different things, the reason that I live. We come knowing we carry a lot from days or weeks that have been busy. And so we come to hand over all that baggage, those burdens, the failures, and the sins of today those things that have distracted us and have gotten in the way of being able to hear what you have to say. Forgive us for missing your Spirit's guiding, for misinterpreting the day's disruptions, still our hearts, open our ears, clear our minds, come and speak to us. In your wonderful name, amen. I'm going to invite Mel to come up and share with us now. Good evening. Ah, oh, there we go. <laughs> it is a wonderful privilege to be here this evening. Um, it's like a homecoming. It's been a little while since I've been here. 
Um, and when I was leaving this afternoon from the office, some of my staff said, do you still know some of the people at Trinity? <laughs> and I said, even though it was a while ago, I think most of the people I still know. So it's, it, it doesn't feel daunting, it feels like home. And it is a privilege this evening to be able to come and to share with you. Um, I know that, that Ian was, uh, he must be almost home now uh, from, from our service. Our service was at six this evening and uh, he was there much earlier. And so um, it's just been such a, it's lovely to have colleagues where you can sort of swap out and visit one another's congregation. So when, I, when Ian and I chatted at the beginning of the year and said, let's do something, we'll do a pulpit swap or do something like this, and this seemed to make a lot of sense as it's always such a busy week for us and uh, we, we, we would take an opportunity to be in each other's congregations and maybe to give you a little bit of a break, although I believe Ian's didn't preach last night and he's not preaching tomorrow night, is he? Okay, so the break was really for my congregation because I was going to be doing all the services. Um, and then when we talked about what we were going to look at, um, Ian said that on his heart um, that this, this particular theme of looking at the same story in Scripture through the different Gospels was what he had in mind. And so I said to him, if I have a choice, I'd love to look at the one that comes from the Gospel of Mark. And so he said, that's fine. Uh, as a choice, I could do that. So this evening's scripture reading comes from John chapter 2, and I'm going to be reading from 13 through until the end of 22. And this is from the NIV, from verse 13. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle, and scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. Then the Jews responded to him saying, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you're going to raise it in three days. But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he had been raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. May God bless the hearing of his word to us this evening. Elsa C. Jerome Co. shares some wisdom on the incarnation through the eyes of her four-year-old. Order, please, my four-year-old asked, marker and notepad in hand. I'll take a grilled cheese, I responded. She went to the kitchen and returned a few minutes later with a plate of plastic food and wooden blocks. Mmm, yummy, 
I said, pretending to eat. This is the best grilled cheese yet. Mommy, she rolled her eyes, that wasn't grilled cheese. Oh, what was it? At this, she launched into an epic story, a parable, if you will. Well, you can't eat grilled cheese because we don't have any grilled cheese. The diner got really busy today. Stacks and stacks of grilled cheese up to the sky. Then a giant, giant monster came. And he ate up all the grilled cheese. Then the diner caught fire. And the monster ran away. Then this little story storyteller said matter of a factly, and that's why we had to move in with Jesus. Wait, what? I said, stunned at this plot twist. You had to move in with Jesus. Yes. My brother and I slept in his nice, comfy bed. You took Jesus' bed, I said, a little bit appalled. Where did Jesus sleep? In the attic, she replied. He gave us his bed. Then she cleared my dishes and went back to the kitchen to play. Scholars may disagree but I believe that this child of God has a pretty good grasp on incarnational theology. Isn't we moved in with Jesus just a different way to saying the word became flesh and dwelt among us? John 1 verse 14. So if you have ears to hear, listen. When your grilled cheese is eaten by monsters and when your diner burns down, and when your life gets turned upside down, Jesus is there. When we face hardship, injustice, division, grief and loss and uncertainty, Jesus is there. It was in the year 70 CE when the, Jewish, the second Jewish temple was destroyed after a conflict between the Jews and the Romans. In the year 66, just a couple of years before that, the Jewish nation rose up and took back Jerusalem from Rome. But when Rome retaliated in the year 70 CE, they destroyed most of the temple. This was a massive blow for the Jewish nation who, at the time, had most of their lives and theology revolving around this central place of worship. And of course, the understanding that this was literally the house of the Lord. This is the place where the Lord dwelt and was and could be sought and communed with if it wasn't just for a few steps and a few people between them and God. So when it was destroyed in the year 70, it was a massive, massive event for the local people and for their faith. Each of the four Gospels shares this particular story of Jesus predicting the destruction of the temple. That the temple would be destroyed, and of course, the compilation of all the Gospels would have only been written after the destruction of the temple. So, for instance, John's Gospel was only written round about the year 90 CE, some 20 years after that actual destruction of the temple. But the words of Jesus would have remained amongst the people and in the back of their minds 
when the temple was destroyed. I would guess that we're all familiar with this narrative of Jesus going into the temple and in anger upsetting all of the things. And because there's very little real action in the Gospels, each time a movie is made of Jesus' life, this is for sure one of the scenes that makes it into the movie. Jesus throwing tables and money and animals all over the place, and that raw anger that just seems to be so present in this account, the frustration. It's a rather dramatic scene that we encounter. But despite it being very familiar to us, there are some major differences that appear in the Gospel of John in comparison to the other Gospels that capture this narrative. And the first most obvious difference is the placement of this particular scene. In the three other Gospels, it is placed directly after Jesus comes into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Wouldn't have been Palm Sunday then, but we celebrate it as Palm Sunday. And so Jesus makes the triumphal entry into Jerusalem on the back of the donkey, and we have the palm branches and people shouting, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, and Hosanna. And then Jesus makes his way into the city and into the temple and then sees this marketplace and all these animals and all these people and all the money changes. And he gets really angry. And this story actually is presented in those three other gospel narratives as the final tipping point for Jesus to be arrested. It's the last straw. It is this far and no further. But in the Gospel of John, this particular narrative finds its way into chapter 2. Now, if you're familiar with the Gospel of John, you will know that John doesn't begin with a, a nativity scene of Jesus being born, he begins with a poetic entrance and theological statement of the word was with God and was God and the light and the dark and all of those things. When that presentation of Jesus happens at the beginning of John's gospel, the very first thing that Jesus does is the wedding at Canaan where they just seem to be guests hanging around. When Mary, mother of Jesus, comes and tells him that, he has, that the wedding has run out of wine and that he must do something. And so we see that reluctance there of Jesus going, woman, my time has not yet come. His ministry has not yet started. But he does it anyway, and he knows that the minute that he does this first miracle of turning water into wine at the wedding, it starts the clock. It starts the beginning of his ministry, and the time between the start and the end is now captured. But more than that, we go straight from that turning the water into wine, this hush-hush experience, this miracle that is still quite under wraps. We go from that, a family setting, a setting that is private with those that are part of Jesus' family. We go from that into the most public way and public setting possible. Jesus is unknown, yet he walks into the temple, he sees all that is going on, and he disrupts it. You would imagine that 
that kind of act would attract a lot of attention. And yet, so early on in the Gospel of John, in the other Gospels, this acts as a catalyst for Jesus' arrest, trial, and obviously the crucifixion of Jesus. But this story doesn't play the same role. It plays a different role in the Gospel of John. I'm sure you're wondering now, what is the event that gets Jesus arrested in John? What is the turning point in John? And that, I might tell you, is the raising of Lazarus. Raising people from the dead doesn't tend to go down as well either. In the other Gospels, Jesus is quite clearly angry with how the temple set up has become corrupt and declaring that as it has become a den of robbers, adding to the people's burdens and charging exorbitant exchange rates and prices for sacrificial animals and other offerings. Yet, in the Gospel of John, Jesus' criticism is not about making it into a den of robbers, but making it into a marketplace. A marketplace. Now to us, when we think of a temple, we think of this kind of building, a version of this because that's our frame of reference. But we, might, we need to be reminded that the temple that was in the years when Jesus was doing his ministry was a building that had all sorts of buildings and rooms attached to it, around it, and it was a large complex. And so in one of the spaces is the marketplace, and not in the actual sanctuary, the worship place. It would have been on an outer section that people would have been able to change their money to temple money and then using the temple money be able to buy the sacrificial animals that were needed at different times of the year. Again, Jesus seems upset that it has become a marketplace. Which is rather odd because it was completely necessary for the functioning of the temple. They needed those people, that marketplace, in order to be able to do and have worship. If Jesus moves it out, it's just going to move to somewhere else. But it's a necessary part of worship. It couldn't function without it. When Jesus is asked by the Jews by what sign or authority he can do this, Jesus replies that the temple will be destroyed and raised up in three days. In other accounts, they talk about the destruction of the temple, but never the rebuilding of it. And of course, the people know that unless by a massive miracle, there is no ways that the temple could be rebuilt in such a short time. It soon becomes clear that Jesus is partly talking about the temple in Jerusalem and its destruction, but that he is referring to something completely different when talking about it being raised up after three days. And even the narrator in John's Gospel makes this connection for us. But in verse 21 it says, but he was speaking of the temple of his body. 
he, after he was raised from the dead, the disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. So we have this idea that there will be a destruction of the temple, but the raising is not talking about the temple building itself, but talking about the body of Jesus. So what is John actually trying to communicate to us and to his audience at that time? In John 1, verse 14 that I read earlier, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. John is writing for an audience that is Jewish. He is pointing his audience, the local Jewish people, away from the temple and towards Jesus, the one who came from God to be amongst us. John, in his gospel, is trying to communicate to the Jews that they no longer need the temple because God has come through Jesus, God Emmanuel. We see this in a number of places as the gospel unfolds. And in the next couple of chapters, we see this when Jesus is speaking to the Samaritan woman at the well. He says, the woman asks Jesus, where must we worship? Her answers says to say, here on this mountain, yet the Jews say in Jerusalem at the temple. Jesus replies and says, Woman, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain or in Jerusalem. When we read the account on Good Friday, those last few events and eventually the death of Jesus. In the gospel narrative, there is this verse that says, when Jesus died, the earth shook, and the temple curtain was torn in two. The divide between God's people and God, the very God himself, was broken down. Friends, part of the Easter message is a realization that God is with us. Emmanuel that he is present in our lives each and every day. And that it is through good and bad that he shares in our lives. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thanks, Mel, for those words. <clears throat> Our closing song tonight um, might be new to some. I didn't realize that when I chose it. But I chose it for the words in the chorus. It says this. It's time to live a life of love that pleases you. I will follow you, Jesus. Um, and so I ask you to come and join us. Stand and sing as we sing. Let the, may the words of my mouth of my mouth and the 
words of my heart. Bless your name, bless your name, Jesus. And the deeds of the day and the truth in my way speak of you, speak of you, Jesus. For this is what I'm glad to do. receive this blessing. May the blessings of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us as we walk this road to the cross, as we move with all those who've gone before us in journeying and understanding the ultimate sacrifice that you've made on our behalf. Go in peace, go in love, and go in the Spirit. Amen.